Okay, in order to really understand semiconductors, you really need to be very comfortable in uh, drawing the flat band diagrams that I've already introduced using PowerPoint. But it's one thing me showing you pre-drawn diagrams on PowerPoint, it's another thing drawing them yourself. So I'm going to go through a, a few diagrams of semiconductors in different situations, and you need to be able to draw this kind of thing yourself and understand what's going on. So uh, the most basic thing you need to be able to do is draw the bands like this. So this would be your valence band and this would be your conduction band. Okay, And in between the two, you've got a band gap and we denote the band gap with E subscript G. Sometimes we see that as capital G, sometimes lowercase g. Okay, the other things that you need to be able to label is, well, I'm going to shade in my valence band and that tells me that my valence band is full at absolute zero. Uh, full of electrons, and the top of my valence band, I'm going to label V, sorry, E, V, E with a subscript V, and the bottom of the conduction band is E with a subscript C. So this designates the energy, the highest energy possible in the valence band, and the lowest energy possible of the conduction band, so EC and EV. And these are just the abbreviations. So you need to know that this is the, the valence band and the conduction band. But what you need to be able to label are the energy levels. Don't forget, lower energy is here and higher energy is there. So this is for um, a semiconductor that has a band gap EG. So of course, you can see that EG is going to be equal to EC minus EV. So one of the ways that you might see this label is we don't need to label the conduction band and the valence band because hopefully you know what it is. So you can draw these and then here you would have E, V, E, C. This is going to be E, G. And E, G is equal to E, C minus E, V. And when you get thermal excitation of the electrons, they move from here into the conduction band. So you'd have electrons here and you'd have holes here. So that's the kind of thing that you need to be able to draw. The one other thing that you need to be able to add to this situation is the Fermi level. So I'm just going to add a dotted line and that is denoted EF for the Fermi level. And don't forget from, uh, from the PowerPoint slides when I went through, the Fermi level it basically tells you the probability of finding an electron at the Fermi level is a half. And we know that because here at absolute zero, all of the electrons are in the valence band and there are none in the conduction band. So you've got probability of one, probability of zero, and here you've got probability of a half. And even after you start to, um, to thermally excite electrons over here, for every electron that you have in the conduction band, you've got a hole here. So for every one that you add there, you lose one here. So the probability of a half remains here, regardless of the temperature for an intrinsic semiconductor. So this is a band diagram for an intrinsic semiconductor. OK, so you need to know what that looks like for uh, an intrinsic semiconductor. You also need to know what your band diagram looks like for uh, a, an insulator and for a conductor. So an insulator is going to look exactly the same. You've got a valence band and you've got a conduction band. But in the case of an insulator, it's just that this energy is going to be far too big for the electrons to ever overcome that gap. So, but the band diagram looks the same. It's just that the band gap is bigger. And for a metal, you end up with electrons in the conduction band at all, all times. So this is partially filled. So uh, the situation is very different. And that's what I tried to show you in the PowerPoint diagram. Now, you also need to be able to draw these band diagrams for extrinsic semiconductors. So the semiconductors that have been uh, doped with something. So I'm going to go through N-type and P-type semiconductors. So we had two different types of doping. So for an N-type semiconductor, you have the same situation where you have a valence band and a conduction band, and your valence band is full, your conduction band is empty to begin with, okay, so we're talking about absolute zero, 
Now, when we have N-type doping, we introduce dopants that are called donors, okay? And the donors are from group five and they've got one extra electron that is not very heavily involved in the covalent bonding process. So it's very easy for it to break free into the conduction band. So because the energy that those electrons need from the, uh, come from the donor atoms, the energy that they need is very small to get into the conduction band. So the way we can uh, visualize that on a band diagram is if this is our valence band and this is our conduction band, and this represents an en increasing energy from bottom to top, well, what energy do those, uh, do those dopant electrons have? Well, that sits around here somewhere. Because we know that it takes very little energy to get an electron from here into the conduction band. So we can represent that as the electrons actually sitting at this energy level that's very close to the conduction band energy. So this is EC, you know that already. And we're going to label this energy level ED, which is the donor energy level. The donor atoms, the electrons have this energy level and it represents that you give it a tiny bit of energy and the electrons are able to enter the conduction band. And it's not until you add far more energy to the system that the electrons from here are being able to be thermally excited into the conduction band. So hopefully you can see at absolute zero, there's no extra energy in the system. So all of your electrons are at the donor level. As you add a little bit of thermal energy, then these have enough energy to transcend this little gap and get into the conduction band and they can conduct charge. And once you get above a certain amount of energy that's equivalent to the band gap energy, then you can get your electrons from the valence band into the conduction band, just like an intrinsic semiconductor. So this is how we draw a band diagram and how we demonstrate it uh, for an extrinsic N-type doped semiconductor. So those are the things that you needed to be able to sketch on there. So we've got EC, ED, and of course, EV, and this is ED here. Now, the Fermi level, we talked about the Fermi level um, on our intrinsic semiconductor. Well, what about this flat band diagram? Well, the Fermi energy level, as I said earlier, is the, the probability there is a half of finding an electron, right? So here we know that at absolute zero uh, electrons, we're going to have some donor atoms with their electrons here at this energy level ED, and our conduction band will be empty. So our Fermi level at absolute zero is going to be halfway between EC and ED. That's the first thing that you need to know. So we draw our energy band diagrams always as we represent them at absolute zero. So here again, if I draw an N-type dope semiconductor, I can represent it in two different ways. I can say this is EC, this is EV, and here I've got ED, and then I know what well, I've got a, 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 dope, a, a donor energy level, so I know it's N-type. But what we usually do is we represent it by drawing in the Fermi level. And we know that the Fermi level will be halfway between EC and ED, and that's EF. So this is what a band diagram looks like for an N-type semiconductor. So you've got your valence band, conduction band, and you've got your Fermi level that is very, very close to the conduction band at absolute zero. Well, the situation with p-type doping is the opposite way around. So if I draw my conduction band here, EC and EV. Now, in this case, I'm going to have uh, acceptor atoms. So these are going to be elements from um, group three that are my impurity atoms, such as boron. And they can be represented as holes, extra holes in the system that are sat very close 
to the uh, to the valence band. And the reason why we can depict them like that is because well, it takes very little energy to ionize these acceptor atoms. Because what's happening is at absolute zero, all of the electrons are in the valence band, nothing in the conducting band, and you've got extra holes in the system from the acceptor atoms. But what we have when we add a little bit of energy is these electrons down here have enough energy not to get into the conduction band. They can't do this at low temperatures, right? Because the band gap is too big. But they can jump straight into these and they ionize those acceptor atoms at very low temperature. And that leaves behind holes in the valence band and of course, in semiconductors, we know it's not just electrons that can conduct charge, conduct electricity, but actually in this case, it's the holes in a p-type semiconductor, it's the holes that are doing the conduction at these types of temperatures, okay? Because you've got holes in the system, so uh, these are able to move across the valence band and you can get conduction. Of course, once you get to above a certain temperature, there is enough for more electrons to go from the valence band into the conduction band, then you get the same situation that you had with intrinsic semiconductors. So you've also got then electrons in the conduction band that can do conduction. So again, going back to the Fermi level, the Fermi level represents where the probability of finding an electron is a half. So again, now I can show you the, the three different scenarios so you have an intrinsic semiconductor, there's no doping, the Fermi level always sits halfway. In an n-type semiconductor, this is n-type, this is p-type, in an n-type semiconductor, the Fermi level is found halfway between the donor level and the conduction band, so this is EF. And then in a p-type semiconductor, well, you have an acceptor level, which is here, EA. And the Fermi level would be found halfway between the acceptor level and EV. So they're the different ways that you can draw that. So usually I wouldn't draw the acceptor level on there. I would draw my valence band, my conduction band energy, and very close to there, I would have EF. Now, in, a, uh, in an intrinsic semiconductor, it doesn't matter what the temperature is, the Fermi level always stays the same, because as you get more electrons in the conduction band, you get fewer in the valence band, so EF remains the same. However, if you want to look at what happens to the Fermi level in an, uh, in an extrinsic semiconductor, let's draw that. This diagram is going to be a little bit different because we're going to draw uh, the conduction band, the, the bottom of the conduction band uh, here, and I'm going to draw EV here, so the top of the valence band, they don't change with temperature. But now what I'm going to depict on this is I'm going to draw the energy level of the Fermi level as the temperature increases. And the best way to think about that, so this is for an extrinsic semiconductor. So let's take P-type for an example because they're the most common. So you've got your Fermi level on a P-type is going to be, let me use a different color, is going to be halfway between my conduction band and my donor level. Now, once we get up to a really high temperature, then my semiconductor is going to act like an intrinsic semiconductor because at very high temperatures, above 450 Kelvin, I'm going to get electrons that go from the valence band into the conduction band. So what we'll do is we'll just extend this and what I'll say is that this temperature here is very high, so let's say 450 Kelvin, and this temperature is zero Kelvin. 
So in my zero Kelvin state, we know that my, where my Fermi level is for my n-type semiconductor. Well, when, once it turns intrinsic at high temperature, actually my Fermi level is going to be exactly halfway between my valence band and my conduction band because it will be acting like an intrinsic semiconductor. And because don't forget, the number of dopants is really, really small. It was a tiny, tiny fraction of a percentage compared to the number of electron hole pairs you're going to, to get when you're in intrinsic region. So that's why the number of, um, when once you're in the intrinsic region, the number of extra electrons that you get from the dopant atoms is completely negligible. So EF will sit around about halfway uh, in my band gap. And so you know the situation at 0K, you know the situation at high K, and it kind of has this shape in between 